Hi, um, welcome everybody and welcome to uh, to, to this podcast. Uh, we're talking today about psoriatic arthritis and the mo most recent guidelines. And we've got a few representation here from from the psoriatic arthritis world and quite a, quite a venerable members of the writing team as well as a patient to actually discuss the psoriatic arthritis guidelines. Um, introductions wise, my name is Marwan Bukhari. I'm the editor of the Journal of Rheumatology and, uh, and a member of the Heaven Committee who looks after looks after and publishes these guidelines within our within our journals. And uh, we'll get everybody to introduce themselves. Let's start off with Laura, ladies first. Uh, yeah, I'm Laura Coates. Um, I'm a rheumatologist from the University of Oxford and a researcher in the field of psoriatic arthritis. I was co-chair of the guideline update. I'm David Chandler. I'm somebody that's had psoriatic arthritis for nearly 40 years and I also run the psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis alliance. And uh, I'm William Tillett. I'm a rheumatologist from Bath in the UK with an academic interest in psoriatic arthritis and I had the privilege of co-chairing the guideline committee with Laura Coates. Uh, let's start off, Laura. Why did you ha why did you think the guidelines needed an update? Well, so the last guidelines were back in 2012, and they were the BSR guidelines for the use of TNF, um, because we didn't have any other drugs at the time. And obviously, since then, we've seen a, a pretty impressive explosion in the number of biologics that we have available, and obviously now the addition of targeted synthetic DMARDs. Uh, so it was clearly time that we needed an update to cover those new drugs. And obviously, it's great having more therapies available for psoriatic arthritis, but it does make choosing them a lot more complicated. So I think that really brings in the need for a guideline to support people in clinic trying to choose the best drug for each patient in front of them. OK, so William, just tell us, I mean, what has this added anything to the already existing guidelines? We've got you've got ULR guidelines, you've got ACR guidelines. So what's this? Is there any additional information here? Sure, Mara. I think that's a, a great question, isn't it? It can be um, really difficult when there's a number of different guidelines all offering advice. I think for us, it was very important to have really clinically applicable guidelines. And I um, I think that's there was a, a gap in the field there. Uh, we were keen to have um, guidelines that were representative of our clinical practice in the United Kingdom, um, where we have, uh, uh, you know, where it's a rationed healthcare system. Uh, but the advantage of that is, is that it allowed us to be just a little bit more specific uh, in our guidance uh, in a way that perhaps um, the GRAPA guidelines or ULAR guidelines or the, even the ACR guidelines um, uh, uh, were, were designed to cover more healthcare systems. But I think even for the BSR guidelines beyond the UK, the, the, these are clinically usable um, for many healthcare systems that have a, that have rationing. Um, so what we've really hoped to achieve is something that clinicians can easily access where they're making um, standard and complex treatment decisions in clinic. Okay. And um, well, going back to it, so uh, you know, Laura, what do you think about your average treatment of psoriatic arthritis? I mean, we've so, we've seen from the data from the national audit that we're possibly not as treated to target as well as we should be doing. Do you think these guidelines will help? Yes, yeah, so I think hopefully this will help with. Um basics like treat to target, shared decision making, all of the key things that we know are important. I think we're in a really um, challenging place at the moment in UK healthcare in general, coming out of the COVID pandemic, a lot of redesign in clinical practice, in outpatient follow-up and how we run our services. But I think it's also potentially a time where we're looking to the future and trying to work out what we want that future to look like and keeping the things that have been beneficial coming out of COVID and trying to lose some of the things that have not been so good. So I think having those basics covered in the guidelines is really important. But as William said, having something that's specific to our healthcare setting that can give you really detailed advice about how to choose therapies is, I think, really important. That's something that we get asked a lot when we're at meetings is what drug do I use for this patient? Um, not that you know, everybody knows or can easily find out which drugs are licensed, but how do you choose them? They're all under pretty similar, nice guidance um, it, for the arthritis specifically. They often have similar outcomes overall. So actually, how do you choose the best drug for, for an individual? And I think that's really important and hopefully helpful within the guidelines. 
Well, that's good. It's very nicely to, to ask David the question. So, David, do you feel that these guidelines have empowered patients to be, be able to access better therapies and maybe have a better, you know, throughput through the clinic so they have a better path and they know where they're going? Yeah, I think they, are, they have. Um, I think, obviously, it's been already said that the, the previous version was produced a long time ago and a lot has happened since. And certainly, We've not been helped by the fact that many drugs aren't sequenced in any way by the, the um, guidance that comes through, say, NICE. It's just pick the best one. And that obviously causes a similar problem for patients as it does for clinicians. Um, clinicians obviously have a best idea about what they think should work, but also patients are also concerned about what should work. And it sort of needs to be discussed, as, as Laura said, around shared decision making, deciding what are the benefits, what domains work best. And I think for patients particularly, understanding that there's a particular guideline for psoriatic arthritis, which is tailored completely for their, their condition. It provides um, a differential between, say, other inflammatory arthritis where the treatments might be slightly different or used in a different way and the outcomes might be different. I think for patients to know that this guideline has been put together by professionals who are working in this area and have a lot of research background who understand what patients want and how these treatments will work is really empowering. I think if we can encourage patients when they have a conversation in clinic to maybe refer to the guidelines and say, look, would this be suitable for me? And have an honest conversation, say yes or no. Um, so I think, yeah, they are likely to empower patients if they can get access to them. And that brings me very nicely into the next question. So some areas around the country, you've got, you know, you only have three, uh, three, three lines of treatment. Some places will have four lines of treatment. Some people have three agents that can be used. So do you think that this guideline will help the conversation between the clinicians uh, and, the, and the commissioners to be able to do things? Uh, William, what do you think? I really hope so. That was definitely in our minds as we were writing the guidelines and we've got statements in in um, in the full guideline and I'd encourage people that you know we've got a number of different ways in which people can access information. There's a cheat sheet, there's a simple figure so if you're pressed for time you can look at that. There's the executive summary but then the nitty gritty is in the full publication. I'd encourage you to go to that if you're going to have these conversations about the number of lines of therapy for instance um, uh, that you might be allowed or have access to because we've got statements there on um, uh, where our position is and we, we very much felt that um, there was no limit to the lines of therapy. If somebody had active disease, uh, uh, you should be selecting drugs that are, licen uh, that are licensed for use in psoriatic arthritis. So, um, Laura, for example, in, in the northeast, they don't have any lines of therapy. People are allowed carte blanche and understand in areas not too far from yourself in, in, in Oxfordshire, there might be a problem. So how, you think you'll be able to have that conversation easily? So I, I think it will support um, and I think we've tried to include some different scenarios as well that may way, may well help in terms of individual funding requests, for example, as well, to try and get funding for patients who don't quite fit the normal rules. Maybe they have predominant enthesitis or very severe oligoarthritis that, that wouldn't usually meet the criteria. I think there is still more work to do, though, so I can understand Commissioner's point of view to some degree in that all of the studies that have looked at efficacy of these drugs have looked at people who failed maybe one, maybe two, maximum three other drugs. So actually, we haven't got good evidence that they work as fourth, fifth, sixth line medications. And that is something that we're working on through BritPact uh, to try and create a, uh, an audit, essentially, nationally, um, to collect that data in those centres that do have access to multiple lines of therapy so that we can then use that large data set to argue with commissioners in areas that are a bit more restrictive. But it's clearly not something that is set down in NICE guidance. There's been no restriction in NICE guidance to numbers. It's just um, commissioners, I think, trying to balance books with very complicated budgets that they're managing as well. Okay. So from the patient perspective, David, do you think that you would be able to use this to actually canvas, you know, members of, of you know, patients up and down the country to say, listen, you know, I think I would need to access more than X number of uh, lines of therapy. Do you think that, that you can actually empower the, the patient voice in, in this situation? 
Well, I think you can probably edge people towards understanding exactly what is available. And certainly um, regionally, we hear through my organisation that um, people are offered one or two and not more and other places they're offered more. And the problem often is that people are moved from one drug to another when one is already working sufficiently. And I think certainly if a drug is working sufficiently enough, but maybe not quite meeting the threshold, maybe other sort of elements should be brought into that. And certainly if somebody's got active psoriasis as well, and many of these drugs work within psoriasis, it would sort of make sense to think about patients raising these issues around, well, will it help my psoriasis too? Can we have a conversation about that? Are there other issues where I could benefit? So I think we can point to patients towards it. And certainly, usually when people contact us as an organisation, it's generally because something's not happening within the NHS. So if they can be empowered to taking a guideline with them and say, look, according to this guideline, this is the right sequence. Would this work for me? I think we have to encourage people to be proactive. And if they've got a piece of paper in their hand or something on their phone or their laptop, they can actually say, look, here it is. Is this right for me? And can we go for a, the commissioners to support this? Um, because bearing in mind, psoriatic arthritis is a lifelong condition. It doesn't just last for one or two courses of drug. You know, I've had psoriatic arthritis for 40 years. And now if, if you're on a drug that lasts for two or three years and you're only allowed three, then what do you do after six years? Um, so we need that sort of level of understanding about chronic disease. Um, Laura, just, uh, lastly, do you have any comments about the fact that now we're beginning to talk about psoriatic disease rather than just psoriatic arthritis? Do you think the 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 uh, the audit tool as well as a, as the guideline will that help us sort of like understand the fact that it's not just about um, you know there's lots of comorbidities etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Does that does it get covered? Yeah, so I think we focused on the the broader. Um, aspect of psoriatic disease. Uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of the biologics have quite similar outcomes for joints. Where we have seen head-to-head -head studies, the results have been pretty similar. So actually, a lot of your treatment decision is dr driven by other factors. It's driven by how severe the skin disease is, whether they have axial involvement, whether they have inflammatory bowel disease or cardiovascular disease or hepatitis. Um, so I think all of those other things are really, really important when we're selecting therapy. And that's probably how we personalise therapy best at the moment, is thinking about the comorbidities, the extra articular manifestations, the skin. Um, so I think that's something that's all there all the way through the guidelines. Um, we had really good keen involvement from an ophthalmologist and uh, an IBD specialist so that we had good representation and expert input from those other specialties. We had dermatology obviously involved um, and that that's very much a crucial part of treating psoriatic disease. I don't think we we should just consider ourselves as joint experts. We need to be thinking about the disease as a whole uh, and taking a much more um, broad approach. Uh, and hopefully these guidelines do that, help you select therapies for different aspects of that kind of broader disease. OK, um, just two two last questions, really. William, what do you think that in rheumatoid arthritis, we keep on talking about remission and I'm famously quoted as saying remission is impossible. Um, do you think that these guidelines will help you get remission in psoriatic arthritis? Or do you think lo low disease activity will be the best way of doing it? Uh, you know, it's, it's a fascinating subject, this. I, I think that we are going to, it's going to help people get closer to remission. Uh, I, I certainly think it's going to work, it's going to help people to work towards treating to low disease activity. And we've, we've really gone to great efforts to help people um, look at how they might apply the treat to target strategy, um, which endpoints they might want to look at. And I think in doing that, people will get closer to low disease activity and even remission. But I, I think as an RA, true remission in all the ways we think about it in terms of complete amelioration of inflammatory disease and complete resolution of symptoms from a, a patient perspective, I think that, that is often a, a, you know, a hard thing to find. OK, now, David, what do you think? Do you think we're obsessed really with the idea of remission and, and preventing damage? Or do you think just that getting what the patient wants, which is to pick up their grandchild or to play golf or to you know pursue their activity is more important? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Um, we all want no disease and a cure, but realistically, um, we have to live with what we've got. And I think most people 
initially would want to have no disease activity. But if you can get to a point where it's livable and you can adjust your lifestyle and you can take other things in consideration, I think that's better than where we were 20 years ago. And I would hope that going forward, we will be in a better place in the next 20 years so that at some point we are closer to having a, a treatment that is next to remission or next to cure. Um, but I think we've got a good stab at it now. And certainly the psoriatic disease group of people are a lot better off than they were. And with guidelines like this, it gives us all hope because many years ago, the, the treatments were very grim and potentially the future was very, very difficult. And for somebody like me, I was told many years ago that I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was 40. You don't get told those things anymore um, because the treatments are so much better. So, of course, we have to be mindful about stopping joint destruction. But also, we also got to make sure the treatment is suitable for people to live with the treatment. We don't want the treatment to be the only thing and you can't live the rest of your life because you're suffering side effects and treatments. Yeah, so the, it's basically poison versus cure is, is, is the conversation that need to be had. So, uh, well, thank you all very much for discussing it. And uh, you, there will be a link to the guidelines and uh, hopefully we will uh, have quite a good update. And maybe next time we come and update the guidelines in five years, uh, we'll be able to have even more precision uh, for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.